Today's episode is sponsored by Regen Ag Lab. Regen Ag Lab is the lab that we trust. I, if you guys want to come up, there's one or two more seats, seats in there and the rest of you guys are going to have to stand up. In preparing for this message, um, I told Joni I wanted to do something different for this, con- this conference. So I apologize if you came in here thinking you would learn something about interceding cover crops or Johnson Sioux or compost or soil health principles. I'm not talking about any of that. Because what I learned from coming to these conferences the last seven years is that too many people come to these conferences and they look, they're looking for tools to implement into their operation to become better farmers. And, I, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of people thinking that, you know, they, they look at something somebody else is doing and they get intimidated and they don't want to do it. Roy and I started coming to this conference the same year, 2017. Before that, Roy hadn't been in farming. He got back into farming in 2017. Since I've known Roy, Roy's gone from a guy who wasn't doing heart regenerative agriculture at all and came into it. And now I know speakers that were speaking at the conferences that I came to in the beginning that Roy has passed in wisdom, knowledge, and implementation and what he's doing in his farm. And it's all because of his mind. And the reason they're not doing it is all because of their mind. It has nothing to do with their area, has nothing to do with their rainfall, has nothing to do with any of it. It's because their mind is in the way of them achieving success and greatness and becoming the best version of themselves. And I spoke at, at the, the, the workshop I did in Tribune, and I talked about... Um, I talked about erosion. I showed a picture of Greeley County and the, the wind blowing all of our topsoil off in Greeley County. It was the most shared photo in December in 2021 on Facebook, and it was my county in erosion just taking the topsoil away. Do you guys realize that throughout history, the Romans, the Greeks, Mesa Verde, all these civilizations fell, not because of the, they, their society collapsed for any particular reason, but because they destroyed their soil. They didn't have the ability to feed their populations. Mesa Verde is the biggest tragedy. Have you guys ever been there? Beautiful city inside of the, 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 the cliffs there, Mesa Verde. Do you know what the scientists have discovered was there a thousand years ago? Forest that they tore down so that they could farm and their crappy farming practices changed the environment and there's no longer a civilization there. I don't want a thousand years from now people going, did you know they used to farm in the United States? I don't want that to happen. And because I don't want that to happen, this is going to be the bluntest, most straightforward talk I've ever given. And I'm guessing some of you are going to walk away from here thinking Jay Young is a colossal jerk. And that's okay. Because this dude right here is going to walk away inspired, pumped up, and ready to change. And I'm willing to risk offending every single person in this room just to get this person to realize he's a world changer. Do you guys understand that? So look, if you walk away from here pissed off or thinking I'm a jerk, I apologize that I don't care. Okay? I'm really sorry. I don't care. I don't like hurting your feelings, but I'm going to risk it in the fact that this guy will walk away from here realizing that he can make a difference. So... What is success? Aside from the definition I put up here on the screen, what is success? Throw them out at me. Happiness. Okay, success is happiness. What else? It's relative. Success is relative. That is a great point. It is absolutely relative. Is it, is it possible we could become successful at the wrong things? <laughs> is it possible that we can set, set goals to achieve things that we shouldn't have even be chasing after. It's important for us to define success in our minds the proper way, to have the proper view of what success is, okay? When you guys think about what you're wanting to accomplish, you need to think really think hard about that. Is that something within your realm of ability to influence? And even if it is in your realm and ability to influence, is it something you should even be chasing after? 
When I was a senior in high school, we had won state as a sophomore. My junior year, we lost in sub-state. The team that beat us went on to win state on the same play that they beat us on. The next year, I'm all pumped up and fired up and we're gonna win state. I had a thousand yards rushing, I had 50 touchdowns, I was all area, all state, whatever the crap else is on the screen up there. We were 12 and one, was I a success? Was I a success? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I didn't think I was a success because you see that one loss? That was in the state championship game. So we lost. I didn't like talking about football. I didn't like talking about my, none of those accomplishments meant jack to me. I didn't care because I didn't win a state championship and that's what I wanted. It wasn't until later on in my life that I read this book that I was able to actually look back on my high school years and think about how stupid I was. John Wooden, the greatest basketball coach of all time, won 12 or 10 championships in 12 years. The first 15 years of coaching at UCLA never won a championship. He didn't care because his goals weren't winning championships. He never set a goal to win a championship. His goals were to get the most out of every single player on his team. He said by that me measure, some of those years that they didn't win championships, he measured those teams as greater successes than a lot of the teams that won championships. Why? Because he got the most out of those athletes. I mean, he had Lou Alcindor, who later became, uh, what's it, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I mean, when he was coaching, he didn't have stupid standards for success like I did. Once I read this book, I was able to look back on my high school career and just be like, hey, I enjoy that. I had a great time with my brothers and we had an awesome, amazing time playing football. And I got past my stupid standards for success. What stupid standards for success do you guys have in your farming operation? What things are you chasing after and thinking make you a success that are the wrong things and things that you shouldn't be uh, thinking about? Is it, man, that my neighbor sees that I'm driving the biggest, best equipment? Is it that my banker knows I have the biggest, best bank account? Is it because my soil organic matter is higher than your soil organic matter? No, I'm, I'm smarter and better at regenerative agriculture than everybody else in this room. What are you guys using to measure for your success in your life? You really need to think about that because when you go, it, it affects every single decision that you make on your farming operation. Because you measure what you're doing based on whether or not you're going to be a success or not. Whether it's going to put you in a position to be victorious in your life. And it's something that we need to be thinking about in regenerative agriculture. What makes us a success? When I was starting my YouTube channel, I come across a, a, a it wasn't when I started, when I got monetized, I, I saw this thing about farmers, uh, the, like richest farmers on YouTube. I was like, I'll watch that. Watched it. It was like, these dudes are killing it. They're making a quarter of a million dollars on YouTube. I'm all, I'm all about getting some bread. Let's find out what they're doing. So I started watching these guys' farming channels. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? People are watching this crap? Like, this is just what they're doing in there every single day and thousands of people are tuning in to watch this? I don't want to do that. I don't want to produce a farming channel. I want my life to impact other people's lives. I want to change people's lives in the area of farming so that they have the tools they need to become the best regenerative farmers or ranchers on their operation. And it dawned on me, you know, that's a small segment of the population. Okay, well then my YouTube channel can't ever be about my numbers. It's never gonna be about that. It's about who can I impact? And are my videos adding value to people's lives? It's not adding entertainment value, but is it adding value to the people in this room? If you tune in my YouTube channel, are you gonna find something that's gonna be help you to be victorious on your farming operation, okay? Now, we're the next thing that we're gonna talk about is setting a mission statement. Before we talk about that, I wanna ask you this question. How many of you in this room identify yourselves as a world changer? Raise your hand if you're a world changer. Okay, so three of you, that's ex extremely sad to me, all right? So, next question. How many of you guys think that regenerative agriculture is changing the world? Raise your hands big. So, how many of you don't think that that's true? Okay, none of you think that's not true. Some of you must be on the fence because you didn't all raise your hands. How many of you think that you're on a path to becoming a regenerative agriculture person, like a person in regenerative agriculture? Raise your hand really big if that's you. Okay, look around the room real quick. Raise, keep your hand up, look around the room. 
Nearly everybody in the room identifies themselves as somebody in regenerative agriculture. <laughs> Nearly all of you think that regenerative agriculture is changing the world, but only three of you consider yourselves world changers. Do you see the disconnect there? If we are in regenerative agriculture and we believe it's changing the world, then we need to identify as world changers. Do you know why? Because then the standard's higher. The decisions I make in my life are higher. I can't be wasting my time. I can't be making stupid decisions. I can't let fear get in the way because I'm a world changer and I'm held to a higher standard. So as we talk on this next deal about mission statement, I want you to have a higher standard for your life than the three of you that just raised your hand. Your world changes in this room. You understand? Understood. Before we move on, there's something else that you need to understand about world changers. Okay? World changers don't let fear get in the way of changing the world. We're going to talk about that principle more, but you guys need to start identifying your fears and not letting them get in the way of achieving greatness that you're called to achieve. Get that out of your life. The next thing that you need to understand about world changers that is really, really, really important. This is something that I realized in my, in my own life. I, when I, when I came, went to my first event that was at a field day, I saw all the people at this field day and I was like, I love this. I love that all these people are here to learn about regenerative agriculture. I'm new to this, but I know that this is, this is, has something that's going to change people's lives. It's going to change people's communities. And I can't wait to the day that I do this. And it was my first year in, so I'm like, I'm not going to do it next year. And every single year, I was thinking, next year will be better than this year. Next year will be better than this year. Right? And I kept thinking in my mind, eventually I'm going to do this until this year, I decided early on, I'm like, I'm going to do this. The YouTube channel has got monetized. I feel like I've got good results. We raised 200 bushel corn without applying nitrogen or phosphorus. I've been talking to all the people in my community until they're sick in their face when they talk to me about regenerative agriculture. This is it. And you guys, when I first made that decision, my, my mindset was by, once I have that, that workshop, half of my county will be doing regenerative agricultural principles 10 years from then. All right? I know that sounds like a crazy dream to some of you. I don't care. That was my dream. So I set up to have a workshop in Tribune, and that's my goal. 50 people, 50 farmers in Tribune come to this. We'll get most of them doing regenerative agricultural principles. And, you know, maybe if we get 10 people outside of my community, great. But, man, 60 people, 50 people from Tribune, that's the goal. That's what we're going to do. So I, I win a, an award for Farm Bureau Conservation or something, something. And so the Farm Bureau from Kansas came out to film that so they could show that at the annual meeting. And so I thought this is a perfect opportunity. I told the, the lady that, that runs the paper in Tribune, hey, come out to Tribune or come out to the farm while they're doing this and, and put it in the paper so we can get as many people in Tribune come to this, this workshop we're going to have so we can use it for advertising for the workshop. She thought it was a great idea. She's all on board with what we're doing. She comes out, puts me on the front page of the paper. I've got YouTube. I've got the front page of the paper. I've got advertisements in the paper. I'm, I'm talking to every single farmer till I'm blue in the face about this workshop. And it comes to the day of the event and six people were signed up from my county. And we get there, only 12 people from my county were there. 12 people. Now, this is what I realized about world changes, my thought for, for you know, changing. World changers don't care about the results. They only cared about the mission. I can't change the people in my community. I can't change their mind. All I can do is sow seeds everywhere I go. Do you know what happened that day that I was able to enjoy because I changed my mindset? A hundred people showed up. People from Carolina, people from uh, Nebraska, Texas, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, Oregon, some other places, all over the United States came because of YouTube. And I was like, wow, YouTube's actually bigger than I thought it was, <laughs> right? They came so that they could learn how to become better at regenerative agriculture and I can change their lives. When you guys go back to your communities and they mock you and they talk trash about you on your back or behind your back because you're doing crazy farming principles that they don't understand, don't care, right? Don't let it bother you. You're totally fine, man. Just hit silence. Nobody cares, right? You can't let it bother you that people don't understand you. That's not your job as a world changer. Your job as a world changer is to go and sow the seeds 
that you're called to sow wherever you go. Some are going to fall upon a path. Some are going to fall upon shallow soil. Some are going to fall upon the seeds. But some are going to fall in good soil. And you're going to change the people's lives who that goes into. So, mission statement. Every single one of you guys need to be thinking about who you are and creating a mission statement for who you are. Because that mission statement, that vision statement that you have for yourself is going to guide you. There's a really cool pop proverb that says, where there is no vision, people cast off our strength. Another translation says, where there is no vision, people perish. All right? If you don't have vision for where you're going, you're not going to restrain yourself when something fun comes along. If you have a vision for where you're going, you can look at that good opportunity and say, hey, good opportunity, that looks like a lot of fun. But you know what? My mission statement is this, and you're going to take me off a different path. And I'm not going on that path because i got a mission to accomplish. Every single person in this room needs a mission statement. I've got great news for you. I only came up with mine two weeks ago. <laughs> right? So you don't have to rush into your mission statement. I had goals. I have other things that are guiding me and getting me going where I'm going. You don't have to rush into your mission statement. This is Jay Fear and Kevin Wiltsey. Those two men live life on a mission. Ke or Jay Fears is like my favorite. Have any of you guys ever heard Jay Fear speak? He's one of the best speakers there are. Because he's not like me who's talking 90 mile an hour and you can't even pick up half the things I'm saying. <laughs> Jay Fear is, is methodical and concise and knows what he's saying. He shares his mission statement. He's like, hey, you gotta have a mission statement. This is mine. Farm forever. Goes on to the next point. But when you go back and you think about the things that Jay Fear says, in it, it's like so deep down the rabbit hole. And it's like he's making it to where it's like if you are hungry and want to know what he's saying, you think about it. If you're just in there, you're like, all right, farm forever. What does that mean? Think about that. Farm forever means that the legacy that he's put in my life and other people's lives that he has touched I'm going to teach those things to my kids. They're going to teach those things to his kids. And Jay Fuhrer is going to farm forever because of the legacy he's left in other people's lives. That's an awesome mission statement. It is short. It's to the point. He knows it. And if you don't get it, he doesn't care. Right? Kevin Wiltsey's completely different spectrum. And it has purpose and power to it as well. I want a business that provides sustainability, profit, and financial freedom. The business will allow for quality family time and provide entertainment and where, an environment, thank you, where our children may return if desired. It goes on. Whenever he has a tough decision on his farm that he doesn't know what to do, he pulls that out of his pocket, reads it, and he's like, okay, all right, that doesn't line up with what I want to do in life. And he just doesn't do that with that thing. That's his ethos that drives him home. That's the driving home factor. How many of you guys have mission statements? Perfect handful of you. You got to change that. You guys that don't have mission statements, change and have a mission statement. And here's the thing about your mission statement. Okay. It doesn't have to happen now, but at least have one for a year. This is Jay Young's mission statement. God has called me to be a farmer to sow two types of seeds. I sow the word of Jesus Christ wherever I go. And I sow regenerative agriculture in, in my farm and others. I sow and God causes it to grow. I love telling people the gospel, right, Jim? That's right. That's right. I love it. All right. Whether you're excited to hear it or not, I don't really care. I just love sharing it. Right. Farmers in my community, whether they want to hear about regenerative agriculture or not, I love telling them. But I feel like that's my calling. And I have a responsibility to do it well. Whether it's, it's being a reflection of who Jesus is in other people's lives or whether it is being an understanding regenerative agriculture and doing it in my own farm, I have a responsibility to authenticity and truth to those two things. And I do those two things well, as well as I can. I fall short all the time, but every time I do, I pick myself back up and I keep moving forward. So whenever you guys do that, you take time and you think about that. And if, like Kevin said, he's going to change his up a little bit, right? If you have something in your mission statement that needs to be changed up, change it up. Once you have your mission statement, start setting goals. How many of you guys have read either of the two of these books? Awesome. That needs to change. You guys all need to read these two books. Completely different focuses on setting goals. Listen, if you have a mission and you don't have goals for how you're going to accomplish that mission, how are you going to accomplish them? What good is your mission statement if you don't have goals and don't have a drive and don't have a focus for what you're doing and how you're spending your time? Okay, before the mission is accomplished, everybody thinks that they're going to set a goal and accomplishment for life. And once they accomplish that thing, then they'll be happy. Look, dude, if you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy when you accomplish your mission. 
If you're not happy every single day and thankful every single day for the life that you've been given and the opportunities you've been given and you don't have an attitude of gratitude, you're not going to be happy. Look, I'm so driven that a lot of crap happens in my day that kind of just doesn't like make me happy, right? Life happens. And if I don't wake up every single morning thanking God for who, who he's created me to be and who he is in my life, and being thankful and focusing on those things, I'm going to have a pretty miserable day. And the people who work for me and with me are going to be miserable too. I'm not a ray of sunshine at all times. And it helps me when I remind myself of who's in control and I'm thankful for it. All right? We need to live lives of gratitude. The second one, um, the, thing on, the other thing on gratitude, if you are a person that complains, please don't talk to me. I don't like being around negative people. So that's my invitation to you to take your negativity to someone else. All right. And if you bring your negativity to me, I'm going to throw it back into you for how grateful you should be about life. So neither one of us are going to be happy. So save yourself some time. <laughs> All right. So me and me and Roy have been going and doing regenerative agriculture for a long time. Okay. I mean, these conferences again, just not a long time, since 2017. Same time. Completely different views of, of regenerative agriculture, completely different directions. I feel like both of us have done a good job and have been successful. All right. There's a thousand ways to be successful in regenerative agriculture. The thing that you have to understand the most is, is that you have to move forward. Too many of you guys come to these conferences and you hear all these things and you're like, yeah, once I get it all figured out, then I'm going to try it on my, on my operation. No, take the things that you've learned, try it on your operation. Some of them you're going to fail colossally at. Some of them you're going to be victorious at. If you're like me, you're going to fail a lot more than you succeed. And that's okay. Because I don't measure my life based on whether or not an idea I applied on my farm was a failure or success. And neither should you. If you're not failing on a regular basis on your farm, you're not trying hard enough. You're not pushing the envelope enough. You're not doing what you can do to become a world changer. You're afraid of failing, and that's going to keep you from the greatness that you're called to. So what does all the people that I've seen at these conferences that go away and are successful like Roy and like some of the other people have in common? Cold therapy is just me. All right, but we're going to talk about that first. All these people are always acquiring wisdom. They work hard. All of you guys in this room, I'm assuming you're working hard because you're farmers, but a lot of you guys are actually wasting your time doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Okay, It's keeping you from accomplishing the mission. So we want to work hard, but we also want to be good stewards of our time. We want to be people who embrace change. We're not afraid of failure. We keep fighting. We're resilient. And we're going to be a people whose why is greater than their what. So the first thing, I do cold therapy. I try to do it every single day. Don't always get to it, but I do it enough that the effects of cold therapy are going to affect my body. Now, how many of you guys don't know what cold therapy is? Awesome. Cold therapy is taking a cold shower or an ice bath for 12 minutes a week. You can do it all at once. You can do it three minutes a day, two minutes a day, whatever it is to be able to get to the 12 minutes at the end of the week. You can do it all at once. Now, how many of you, I mean, not just by looking at your face, I can tell most of you think that's stupid and crazy. All right. The reason that cold therapy is so beneficial, I don't want to say reason. There's about 16 reasons that cold therapy are beneficial. It releases norepinephrine, right? It also causes you to not, uh, or I mean, if you have a chance that you should get tested to see if you have the genes for dementia. Because if you have a double copy of dementia, there's a high chance you're going to get dementia. Cold therapy will reduce the odds of you getting dementia by 60%. All right. It also, when you get out of the shower, the bath or the shower, your body immediately releases endorphins while your body is trying to wake up. So if you have your lunch break and you turn the shower, the bath on, throw some ice packs in there, get done eating and hop in the cold bath. Instead of feeling like you got to take a nap in the middle of the afternoon, you get in there, you start jackhammering, you get out <laughs> and then you're awake. <laughs> and it's not just the cold, your body actually is releasing endorphins and you feel like a million bucks. If you're the type of person that like me, you like to wake up in the morning and pray, but you're also doing this. Oh, oh thank you, God. <laughs> and then you keep falling asleep. You take a cold therapy in the morning before you pray or before you read or before you do whatever you do. You're not going to be falling asleep. You're going to be awake and alert because of all the endorphins rushing through your body. It causes your brown fat cells that we don't have as adults 
to come back. When you're born, you have brown fat cells. When you come, become an adult, you lose them. Cold therapy causes your body to produce brown fat cells. This boosts your metabolism. There's a ton of reasons why this is beneficial. The thing I love the most about it is it sucks. <laughs> Every single one of us should be doing this just for that particular reason. It sucks. When you get in that water, there's never a time that you won't get in the ice bath and go <sighs> because it takes your breath away because it's so cold. And that's where the benefit comes in because you start breathing slowly. <sighs> I play a song. It's called Psalms 46. The Lord of hosts is with me. And I just think about that. The Lord of hosts is with me. And I breathe in and out and I relax. And I just think about how cold it is, how miserable I, I, I am and how much I love it. Because in my mind, I'm thinking I'm beating the ice bath. I'm beating my mind. I'm beating everything in, in me that's telling me to get out of this ice bath. I'm going to be victorious. Same thing with doing squats. I hate squats. But I love it because when I get done doing a squat workout, I'm like, yes, I overcame my mind. Do you guys understand that all these things I lifted up here? Making YouTube videos sucks. Harvest sucks. Aaron, how is calving in the snow? It sucks. Right? Lifting weight sucks. Eating healthy really sucks. <laughs> Making this presentation sucked. It took way longer than what it should have. Transitioning from conventional farming to regenerative agriculture sucks. All these things suck. All the things worth your, that are worth something in your life are hard and are difficult and take mental toughness to overcome. And you're not ever going to get there if you don't have that mental toughness. So if you get a chance, watch this good video that Jocko Willink put out. Um, he talks about having this mindset that everything you see that's a challenge in your life, you say good to. All right, acquire wisdom. I love Proverbs 4, 7. It says, the beginning of wisdom is acquiring wisdom. And with all of your acquiring, get understanding. If you're going to start with getting wisdom, the very first place you start is going out and getting it yourself. Acquire that thing. Read books, watch YouTube videos, listen to podcasts, and know that your best way of learning and reading. And you know what? Most of us think that we don't have time for this. And that's why we need to have goals. Because we don't let time just kind of slip away and do whatever it wants. We say, hey, this is when I'm going to learn. This is when I'm going to acquire wisdom. I'm listening to this <coughs> podcast. I'm watching this YouTube. I'm reading this many books. And I shape my time around those things. I don't let time get away from me. I manage my time. You guys understand that? You can't tell me that you don't have time to read books or you don't have time to do this, this, or this. You have all the time in the world. It's up to you to be a good steward of it. So the other verse I have on there I want to cover, the Proverbs 13 says, he who walks with wise men will be wise. You need to be putting wise people into your life. You need to be pe putting people into your life that are going to sharpen you. Iron sharpens iron. The next verse I put on there is bad company corrupts good character. You need to identify the people that are dragging you down and eliminate them from your life. I have plenty of negative people in my life, but I make a mental note that when I'm around them, I'm going to encourage and influence them. And all the negative crap they're telling me, I'm not even going to think about it. Because I'm not letting them bring me down. I may bring them up, but they're not going to bring me down. And if they're a negative person, I may interact with them. I may be kind to them. I may be do all kinds of things to be a blessing into their life but they're not going to be in my inner circle. Who's in your inner circle? Are they people that build you up and lift you up? Are they people that tear you down? You need to think about that because that's just as important as the books you read and the podcast you listen to. Stop wasting your time on TikTok. I don't have time. The average <laughs> American spends 95 minutes on TikTok. Stop wasting your time on YouTube. Now, if you're watching my videos, spend all the time in the world you want to watch on YouTube videos. Okay? But if you're watching stupid cat videos or something like that that's taking away from your mission, stop doing it. And if you have to have these things in your life, great. Put a 15-minute timer, watch your little TikTok videos, and then get the crap off. This is ridiculous. 95 minutes? That means that there's enough people watching two hours of TikTok to bring the five-minute watchers of TikTok up. That makes me want to throw up. You know what else is bad about this? The Chai Coms are the ones that make TikTok. <laughs> They're 14 year olds. They have a time limit. They can only be on there for 40 minutes and they are only watching educational, patriotic, and museum exhibits. You think our kids are watching museum ex exhibits and things that are like, America's great, yay kids. Heck no, they're not. 
You're adults. Are you watching TikTok? Yeah. You tell me it's for the, 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 all the awesome things you're learning about regenerative agriculture? Okay, sure. Look, if you want to have a secret TikTok habit, that's on you. But only do it for 15 minutes. Don't be wasting your life. <laughs> embrace change. You guys have to be willing to embrace change. If you're not, you're letting fear dictate your life. Stop letting fear dictate your life. I gotta go flow through some of these things. You guys have to embrace fear. Every single one of us are insecure. Every single one of us have fears and are afraid of failing or afraid of something. Everything's different. Obviously, Jim Garrish and I, we don't really have a fear of public speaking. Some of you, if I was like, hey, could you stand up and take my, my presentation from here on out? You'd be like, ah, I don't think so. You guys know what the number one fear of Americans is? Public speaking. That means that most of you in this room would rather die than come up here and give a presentation. Think about that. Is What is it that would cause you to be afraid of coming up here? Is it because you're afraid of what everybody else in this room thinks? Right? Let's, let's let, think about what your fears are and lean into them. You can't let fear dictate your decisions. Jay, how do we start? How do you start? How do you start leaning into your fears? Okay, so for me, you have to begin, like a, a lot of times like stressors or what the question was, how do we identify those fears and how do we lean into them? Okay, so sometime a long time ago, I lost the, I, 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 I lost my fear of caring what, what most people think, like strangers, eat people I, I care about, I just, I lost that. Now I realized recently um, that my dad, uh, that I'm afraid of failing my dad and not living up to this magical standard that I think my dad has for me, it's not even real. And so the thing, and this is tough, right? Because for me, the thing that I think about is, is I bring everything back to, to my faith, right? I know that my heavenly father loves me and, and values me and created me for a purpose. And so even with my dad, when I identify that, that I get mad and angry at my dad at work because I feel like I'm failing him and that whenever I, I screw up that I'm, I'm, I, and he's, he's saying, hey, what happened here? I'm hearing, hey, why did you screw up, you colossal failure, when he's not even saying that. I'm, I'm playing into this insecurity that's not even real, right? So once you identify that insecurity that's not real, hey, my dad doesn't think I'm a colossal failure. The reason I think that or want that is because my worth and my value is coming from what my dad thinks about me. And it's not even what he thinks about me. It's what I perceive he thinks about me. So once I've identified that thing, I can let it go and I can say my worth and my value doesn't come from what my dad thinks about me. So that's the problem is, is if you're identifying these things that your worth and your value comes from, if it's something that can be taken away from you, <coughs> then you're always gonna live in fear because that thing can be taken away from you. I don't live in a place where I'll ever lose God's love for me. So like if, if I'm able to focus in on that, like I'm not ever, I'm, it's not something I, I, I can lose. Um, on the, that, and that's, so fear, fear of losing. So that, that's something else that I had to, I, to come up with is, is like, I started walking into my prayer times and I would be overwhelmed by everything going on in my life and everything going on with the farm and, and realizing like I've committed to way too many things. I'm, I'm gonna crash and burn and this is not gonna be good. And uh, like I started just to try to pray about those things and try to relax, but those things were overwhelming me. And when I just stood back and just thought, okay, does God love me? Like regardless of whether I, I succeed or fail? Okay, he does, all right, so Will, will this person that, that's my friend in my community care if I, I, that I don't do Young Red Angus anymore, if I don't have a bull sale anymore? Is he gonna judge me and think terrible things about me? Well, no. Okay, well, this guy that I don't, I don't even know you, but like this guy thinks I'm a colossal failure if I don't do Young Red Angus anymore. Is he worth my time and effort of worrying about what he thinks? No. Well, then what does it matter if I give up anything in my life? If I lose anything in my life, what does it matter what other people's opinions are, right? So for me, once I am able to do that and calm down and relax and I focus on the thing that's most important to me, I set my eyes on those things and then I can relax about everything else. So, you know, if you guys aren't, you know, believers, I know that doesn't really help you, but for me, like once my hands are open and God can take anything out of my hands that I'm not holding on to, then there's no pressure for me to perform. I just, I'm gonna walk in this place where I'm walking with what I think he's doing and it takes stress and pressure off my life. Um, but I think that when we think about it in terms of, of like this story that we're going to tell about Lieutenant Dykes, have you guys seen Band of Brothers? 
Okay, so what, what do we know about Lieutenant Dykes? Was Lieutenant Dykes a good leader for you guys that watched Band of Brothers? Don't remember? You guys don't? It's been that long? Okay. No. So Lieutenant Dykes was, was the company um, commander, like, put in place of Easy Company after Winters got promoted. Lieutenant Dykes was a West Pointer that wasn't cared about, didn't care about leadership, didn't care about his men. He only cared about the position that being in that position of leadership earned, earned him and would get him. So Winter, they, they have to take this town at Foy, and Winter sits him down and says, this is what we have to do. This is the objective, and this is what you need to do. Do not fail us. And he says, okay, and he walks in there, and the bullets start flying, and the mortars are landing, and everything around him that's blowing up freaks him out, and he hides behind this hay bale and tells everybody to fall back and to wait for the men that are, that are going behind Foy to clear it while they hide behind the hay bale. Does that sound like a recipe for success? No. This is one way that we, this is an example of somebody that, that let fear dictate his life. Now we're going to watch somebody who doesn't let fear dictate his life. This, you're going to see, is going to be winners trying to get um, uh, a Dyke to move, and then he can't, so he decides to put in new leadership. Keep moving! Get Captain Wears! God damn it, you do not go out there! Tell the battalion commander, now get back here! I think I understand your attachment to Easy Company, but you... Spears, get yourself over here! Get out there and relieve Dyke and take that attack on in! Hang on, Perko! I'm taking over. Precision, listen! What do we got? Sir, most of the company is spread out here. First platoon tried to end around, but they're stretched out. They're pinned down by a sniper. I believe he's in the building with the cave-in roof. All right, I want mortars and grenade launchers on that building till it's gone. When it's gone, I want first to go straight in. Forget going around. Everybody else follow me. Yes, sir. Thank you. the Germans didn't shoot at him. I think they couldn't quite believe what they were seeing. But that wasn't the really astounding thing. The astounding thing was that after he hooked up with I Company, he came back. understand the difference between Spears and Dykes? Spears, or Dykes was focused on the bullets flying around his head. He was too worried about dying to be concerned about the men that were standing, that were right beside him, they were getting shot and killed. He was focused on himself. Spears was completely opposite. It wasn't that Spears didn't see the bullets, he saw the bullets. He saw the mortar blow up right in front of his face when he ran out into the field. But his mind is set on the mission and accomplishing the mission and the men around him. What is your mind set on? Are you set on the mission that you've been, that, that you've been called to that's in your heart that you're focused on? Are you focused on what everybody else in your community is saying about you? Are you focused on other people's opinions of you? Are you focused on whether or not you'll fail or live up to some ridiculous standard that you set in your mind that you shouldn't even have? Where is your focus? Because if your focus is on the wrong thing, then you're going to fail every single time because you're chasing the wrong thing. I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of, 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 of coming to these conferences and seeing people focused on the wrong thing. People will tell me like, oh, 
you know, I haven't, you know, I'm going to try cover crops next year. I'm like, like what are you going to do? I'm going to try cover crops. We can come to the same conference for yield for spoil, and you're just now going to try cover crop. <coughs> Talk to a guy, hey, you know, how did Johnson Sue Bio Reactor go for you? Same, it was in the same session, heard Do Dr. Johnson talk the same time as me. I said, hey, you know, how did Johnson Sue Bio Reactor go? I didn't make one yet. The dude just gave you keys to reduce your nitrogen cost by, or by 85% and eliminate phosphorus. Gave you the keys. Showed you exactly how to do it. And we're a year out and you didn't do anything with it. Man, the, the thing that it's, I look at Dan in the back of the room and Dan has the same trajectory as me with this stuff. Only I have a silly YouTube channel teaching people to build it. And Dan's got a company that has eight different sites and he's got thousands upon thousands of ton of compost that he's selling to people at a ridiculously affordable price. So almost the exact same trajectory. One year before me started doing stuff with compost. Man, do you guys know the possibilities that are right before you that you can become? But we let fear dictate everything we do. The last three lessons that we get to learn. Man, I'm so excited because I got like all kinds of time left. <laughs> Man, this is good. The last lesson we're going to learn is from this guy and this guy. Who's this guy? Yes! I love it. Who's this guy? Oh, you, some of you know. Yes, this is going to be great. I love this story. The Mike Tyson Buster Douglas fight has so many great life lessons. We're going to focus on these three. Keep fighting, be resilient, and your why has to be greater than your what. Iron Mike Tyson going in this fight, 37-0. and 0. Do you know what you had to do if you watched the Mike Tyson fight? You had to get there early, early because he knocked out every single dude in the first two rounds. They called him Dynamite Mike as well. The youngest heavyweight champion of the world. The odds going into this fight opened up at 27 to 1. And they jumped to 37 to 1. You know why? Some rich dude said 27 to 1, give me $54,000 on Mike Tyson to win too because there's no way Buster Douglas is winning this fight. At 37 to 1, somebody said, I'll put 1500 down bucks down on, on Buster Douglas. But somebody else was like, heck no, I'm betting over $90,000 so I can get my three grand off this fight because there's no way Buster Douglas is winning. And it went to 42 to 1 odds. Tyson going to beat Buster Douglas. One person believed that Buster Douglas would win this fight. You know who it was? Heck no, he knew who Mike Tyson was. Buster Douglas' mom. Buster Douglas' mom would go all around the community telling people, my boy's going to knock out Mike Tyson. My boy's going to be the first one to take down Tyson. He's like, yo, mom, it's Mike Tyson. Calm down. He go, she goes around everywhere. And if you guys want to rewatch this for a year later and share this with somebody, there's a YouTube video about this, just Buster Douglas Tyson motivational. But this is why Buster Douglas wasn't, you know, like he believed he could do it. But I mean, well, look at this dude. Watch this one. That's the fastest knockdown in a heavyweight fight. It's like less than six seconds. This is like round two. Boom, the dude's down. Round two, watch. Well, you guys want to fight the guy? Somebody was talking about like getting a million dollars to fight Mike Tyson. They're like, why would you do that? Yeah, you'd have a million dollars for the rest of your life. You'd be like, hmm, 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 hmm. <laughs> your jaw wired shut. That's why no one believed that Mike Tyson would beat Buster Douglas. The fight comes around and Buster Douglas does better than anybody had done against Mike Tyson. Made it to the eighth round, but the miss happens in the eighth round. He gets knocked down. They start counting it out. It gets to eight, nine. Buster Douglas gets up. He gets lucky because he got knocked down with three seconds left to go in the eighth round. And they go out to fight, and the bell's ringing. He goes to the corner. Then the ninth round comes out, and Tyson knows he's got him beat. And Tyson comes out there swinging. But what did Buster Douglas do? He fought back. And in the tenth round, this happened. <laughs> Rolling willingly just to try to get in the shot that will finish things in oh, what, what an uppercut by Douglas. Right down goes Tyson. Down goes Tyson. Douglas wins. Something changed after this. Mike Tyson was 37 and 0, and after this fight, people started beating Mike Tyson routinely. Do you know why? 
is because people learn something from this fight that if you kept fighting, you could beat Tyson because Mike Tyson only had power in the first few rounds and then Tyson got wore out because he didn't have the mental capacity to be a great boxer. He had the tools, but he didn't have the mental capacity. So life lesson number one that you need to take away from this fight is that if you're gonna be in regenerative agriculture, you have to keep fighting. When you've done cover crops for three straight years on one field, and then you do a cash crop that fails, and then you graze that milo, and you make a mistake and graze it too long, and it blows away after the four years of hard work that you put in that, you have to keep fighting. You can't be some chump that says cover crops don't work because you screwed it up. You have to keep fighting. When you take that same photo of your ground blown and you put it on Facebook to encourage other people to keep fighting, and those stupid schmucks from Eastern Kansas tell you that if you were just doing cover crops longer, you could figure it out, you keep fighting. Because other people's opinions and all the other things that come around you and come at you don't matter. You're on a mission. Because you know that we're going to end the stupid windstorms that are going. And we're going to eliminate the dead zones. Because you're on a mission to be someone who's a world changer. You have to keep fighting if you're a world changer. The next thing is resiliency. I love this story of Jay Fuhrer. Jay Fuhrer, early on, when he was in the USDA, he realized he couldn't keep doing the same crap. He was done with giving prescriptions for terraces and all this other stuff that wasn't working. So he, he, they're going to have a meeting with the USDA, and he calls up and he says, hey, can I have a little bit of time to share what we're planning on doing at this meeting? And they said, you got five minutes before lunch. Now, as you guys know, you're getting hungry and you want me to wrap this up. Five minutes before lunch, not the greatest time to speak, right? So they get Jay Fear five minutes before lunch, and Jay Fear stands up courageously and says, hey, we're, I'm done treating these symptoms. I'm, I'm done with it. Like, we're going to get to the source of the problem and we're going to begin to change these problems and we're going to change things we're going to focus on diversity and went through the things we're going to shape what they're going to face people were very respectful and listened to jay lunch came around and jay fuhrer ate alone jay fuhrer tells that story jokingly like it's funny that he ate alone how many of you guys like being alone we're here now when everybody's talking about regenerative agriculture, Jay Fear was doing it when no one else was saying, yeah, you got this, Jay. Forget about what everybody else is saying. Jay Fear was a pioneer. You guys know that they did a study, uh, like I heard Nicole Masters telling the story, I forgot the name of the book, but they did a study of 100 SS soldiers after World War II. Of the 100 men that were SS soldiers that brutally murdered thousands upon thousands of Jews, each one of them, you know how many of them were psychopaths and sociopaths? None of them. None of them. How did they get to where they were able to and willing to commit these terrible atrocities on their fellow man? Because it's what everybody else was doing. One of the most courageous things that you can do is do what you know is right when no one else is doing it. When everybody in your community is making fun of you behind your back. And people are mocking you, and you don't care because you know what's right. And that takes resiliency. And when I talk to people in regenerative agriculture, I'll ask them a lot of times, like, what was the hardest thing you had to overcome? My community, man. Like, everybody's making fun of me. Everybody's mocking me. When you're willing and you understand how courageous you are to go on that path <coughs> when you're going alone, that's when you know you're a world changer because you don't care what everybody else thinks. And the last thing is... Your why has to be greater than your what. When Buster Douglas knocked down Mike Tyson, the guy runs up to him right after the fight, sticks a stupid mic in his face, says, well, how were you able to do it, Buster? You know, they want that instant sound bite, that instant clip. You know what Buster Douglas said? Hey, I know. Planet gave his mother. mother. In what mother. way? God bless her heart. <laughs> Two words, my mom. <laughs> the other thing I didn't tell you guys about this fight is that Buster Douglas's mom died three days before the fight. Oh my God. When Buster Douglas was on the camp canvas, he wanted to stay down. He didn't think he could beat Mike Tyson. He was down on the, the canvas and he, was, he waited the eight count because he was contemplating whether or not he wanted to even get up and keep fighting. And then he thought of his mother and he realized, if I don't get up right now, my hopes and dreams of becoming a heavyweight champion die with my mother. 
and he got up because his why was greater than what knocked him down. Every single person in this room has been knocked down. We've all been punched in the face and we've all been hit hard and we've been on that place where we're on the canvas. And what's going to determine whether or not you're victorious and you're going to be a world changer is whether or not you get up and fight. And that's what we have to be is people who are willing to fight. This is my why. When I got my YouTube channel monetized and I was looking at all this other stuff and I made that decision that, you know what, my YouTube channel is going to be about this. Something else took place. I prayed and I asked God, I'm like, what's my purpose in all these things? Like, why have you shown me this favor I don't deserve? Because I look at a lot of people at this conference and a lot of speakers and a lot of farmers and they all know a lot more than I do. And they're a lot more talented at so many things than I am. And I've been given this, this undeserved, in my opinion, favor that God's blessed me with. And so I made the decision that at the end of every conference, I would share this verse and tell people, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he is founded upon the seas and he's established upon the rivers. I love coming to Colorado and seeing the mountains and seeing the, God, the beauty God created the mountains. I love being in the ocean and just imagining how big the ocean is. I love taking soil within my hand and thinking about the thousands upon thousands of species of fungus and bacteria that God has placed right within my hands. And all of those things are so incredibly beautiful to me that it overwhelms me. Yet the Lord that created all of it says that you are his most beautiful creation and he loves you so much that he died to purchase your soul from hell because he is madly in love with you. And I decided that when I, I'm going to do all this, that I have to tell every single person this because I've been given this, this burden to celebrate that, to tell people, this is your purpose. This is your calling. This is my calling. He created us for a purpose, to be world changers, to give value and life and blessing to other people's lives. And if I don't tell you at the end of my presentation the most important thing to me, then I'm, I'm failing you. So that's my presentation, and that's what I want you to walk away with. Your why has to be greater than your what. And you need to find that why. Every single person in this room needs to find their why. And when you get punched in the face and you get knocked down, you have to keep fighting. Thank you guys so much. It is dinner, lunchtime. If you want to head over and eat lunch, that's great. If you want to ask me questions, that's fine too. Thank you so much.